So, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are. And welcome to the first edition of the Fireware Smart Cities Day. My name is Valdo Oliveira. I am the Press and PR Manager here at Fireware Foundation. I would like to thank each one of you for joining us today for this exciting event. Before I jump into today's stellar speakers lineup, I will go over some housekeeping with you, if that's okay with you, of course. We ask all attendees to mute themselves and turn their cameras off throughout the presentations to avoid any potential connectivity issues. Secondly, this is a live event and is being recorded. That means that by attending this event, you agree to the recording, which will be made available on Fireware's YouTube channel afterwards. Should any of you have any questions for our outstanding speakers, and we highly recommend, encourage you to do so, please drop them into the chat and, um, and also tell us for which speaker the question is for. In addition, I take the opportunity to say a massive thanks to our media partners, Business Reporter, Compact List, Smart Cities World, and Zoom Global Cities for their incredible support in disseminating this event. Now, for those of you who may not be familiar with us yet, we can certainly change that. Uh, one of my colleagues are dropping some pretty cool links into the chat to get you acquainted with us. Fire Foundation is a nonprofit organization that drives the definition and encourages the adoption of open standards, implemented using open source technologies to ease the development of smart digital solutions across multiple, excuse me, multiple domains. Now, without further ado, let's welcome today's speaker lineup, and I will apologize in advance if I do say um, your name wrong, so forgive me for that. Now, uh, we, have, we are very excited to have Dr. Jonathan Reichenthal, best-selling author, founder and CEO at Human Future, who will be moderating today's event. We are also thrilled to have Cornelia levy Benchenton, writer and communication strategy consultant. Equally, we have Peter Fatelnik, Minister Council for Digital Economy Policies at the Delegation of the European Union to the US. Furthermore, we have Jason Witten, Digital Innovation Lead at Amazon Web Services. We have Paul Wilson, Chair at Smart Cities World and a Senior Advisor to UK 5G. We have our very own Juan Hu Yeho, the CTO here at Fire Foundation. We have all the way from Brazil, Pedro Martins, Planning Manager at Centro de Operações Rio, Rio Operations Center. Marcos Marconi, Founder and CEO at VM9. They will jointly present the Brazilian use case here. We have Ian Hoff, Managing Director at Civity, one of the Fireware's uh, members, as well as VM9 from where Marcos is from. We have Franz Sava Favon Bichelon, Service Manager for e-Government and Trusted Services at VM Digital in the city of Vienna. Last but not least, we have our very own Christina Brandt Delta, the Chief Marketing Officer here at Fireware Foundation. We hope that you enjoyed this time with us and leave here today with some interesting perspectives on how smart city technology can make cities more effective and efficient, which is a must today, given the projected fast growth in urban population that is expected in the next few decades. Now, uh, I will now hand it over to the person who will be steering the direction of this very important dialogue here today, someone who needs no introduction, but here is a short one anyway. Dr. Jonathan Rajentau is the best-selling author, founder, and CEO at Human Future, 
And what is Human Future? Human Future is a global business and technology education and investment firm. Jonathan is the former Chief Information Officer at, for the city of Palo Alto in the US and the multiple award-winning technology leader whose 30-year career has spanned both the private and the public sectors. Jonathan also creates online education for LinkedIn Learning and recently published Smart Cities for Dummies, a book for which Fireware has been invited and contributed to, and we absolutely loved how it turned out. Jonathan, the stage is yours. Off you go. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Good morning. Uh, very early here in San Francisco, but I'm delighted to be on. Uh, hello to wherever you are in the world. We got a really amazing planned uh, set of speakers this morning, and we have some of the just the world's experts on, on smart cities and fireware today. So I think it's going to be a rich uh, experience. I'm thrilled to be involved. I've only started to really get knowledgeable on fireware in the last uh, year or so. I'd heard about it for a while, but uh, having written this book about the future of cities, I, I said I must include fireware, and I was so thrilled uh, to begin to have a great relationship with them. And the more I understood the, the suite of products and their mission, the more I liked it. So I hope you also uh, learn about uh, the Fireware and the Fireware Foundation uh, today and uh, are inspired to learn more and perhaps even move forward. For a lot of my American uh, United States colleagues, you're learning about Fireware, I think, for the first time. So this is uh, particularly exciting. Now, I just wanted to say a few words before I introduce some incredible uh, thought leaders um, in, the, in the urban innovation space. You know, this is great work. Cities really matter. You know, you can do work that matters, that's meaningful and valuable, and you can also do work that has an economic uh, benefit. So you don't have to choose. This is one of the great things about the work that we do. You can do valuable work and you can create jobs and economic activity. Now, I was often sitting on the other side of the, of the table in the uh, buyer-seller uh, transaction when I was uh, a leader in a city. And what I found was, you know, there was some good technology tools out there to solve problems, but there wasn't enough. I always wanted more. I wanted to see more innovation. And that still carries on to today. There's still amazing, phenomenal opportunity to build new ideas and deploy them in our cities. And frankly, our, our cities and need them. The opportunity is for existing players, you know, for new players, for startups, and uh, it's an opportunity for completely new models for delivering uh, solutions and solving some of the big intractable issues you're gonna see today. Now, what does this market look like? How big is the future of cities market or what we like to call a smart cities uh, movement? Well, Frost & Sullivan, uh, one of the uh, a terrific uh, consulting firm, recently published their, their report on what the world will look like in 2025. And they're projecting that the smart cities movement is worth $2.4 trillion. That's with a T, trillion with a dollar. So this is not only uh, indicative of the opportunity, but also the scale and size um, of the problems we need to solve uh, around the world. Now, I wanted to talk specifically about one element of our cities, and that's the use of the internet of things. Right. This is going to be one of the big ones. Right. We've been connecting people for the last 20, 30 years to the Internet. And now, as you know, we're connecting a, a lot of devices and it's off the charts. You know, this year we will have connected about 30 billion devices with a B, 30 billion. And by 2025, it's projected we will deploy uh, in our communities 75 billion devices. So we're going to be connecting a lot. Um, and it's going to be doing things like gathering data, doing things like monitoring. Um, we're going to see the sensorization of our urban environment. It's a really big deal for the need for skills, the need for new technologies like fireware, which really works well in this space, and, and much more. All of these sensors are going to create enormous amounts of data. You know, it's the one thing that cities have an absolute abundance. In fact, uh, IoT alone is going to create 4.4 zettabytes of data. Yes, that's a real word. You know what a zettabyte is? It's one sextillion bytes. 
<laughs> Who thought that sextillion was an actual word? Well, it is. Uh, a zettabyte is one with 21 zeros. And we're going to create 4.4 of those um, uh, just this year alone uh, via IoT. Now, the Internet of Things is just not connected devices. It's also things like uh, machine learning, cloud and edge computing, and things like uh, control systems. And what are we doing with all this? Well, here are the sort of, according to a new survey, just came out a couple of weeks ago, the priorities of how we're using IoT in our communities. The number one way we're doing it is by connecting public transit. Now, I wanted to tell you a quick story. I was born and raised in Ireland. Not a lot of people know that. Uh, some people detect something in my accent um, because of, you know I, I still have a little bit of that Irish accent, but I've been here in the US over 25 years. And when I was growing up in Ireland, when you went to a bus stop and you waited for a bus, which invariably uh, we all did as kids and teenagers, we never knew when the bus was gonna come. We just had to stand there and wait and eventually the bus would come. Um, today, most kids don't have that problem. On their smartphone, it tells them when the bus is coming or when the train is coming or whatever transit there, it is that they have um, beckoned. Um, so uh, it, it, they will never know the fun of standing in the rain, waiting for a, a bus and not knowing when it's coming. Somebody said to me uh, a few days ago, well, didn't you have a timetable? I said, yeah, we had a printed timetable, but it meant nothing. <laughs> the, the bus is never kept at the timetable. Um, the second priority is traffic monitoring. Uh, traffic monitoring, very important. You know, it, it can help with everything from um, accidents to creating more efficient intersections. Number three is monitoring water and things like flood monitoring. You know, with 630 uh, cities on coastlines around the world representing about 1.3 billion people, um, as the climate emergency continues and the water rises, flooding is going to increasingly be an issue in over 600 of those cities. The next one is video surveillance. And I will say, my I'll put my little plug in here, let's do video surveillance, but let's be very respectful of privacy and make sure that's a priority. And finally, connected streetlights, connected streetlights. I'm sure we'll hear more about these areas in the wonderful talks we have uh, this morning. So as IoT gathers momentum, the uh, city's market for IoT specifically will be worth about $260 billion. Uh, by 2025. Uh, that's a CAGR, by the way, of 18%. Um, uh, dare I say it, might be a great investment for a lot of you. Um, and we'll need platforms like Fireware to help manage and optimize the opportunities to create smart solutions with uh, IoT technology. So that's a, just a couple of my quick thoughts to get things kicked off this morning. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, with that, I want to introduce the um, uh, well, before I do, because I see my little slide coming up here, um, I'll put in a little plug for my new book. <laughs> if you like this topic, the smart city topic, and I'm sure you do because you're here, um, I'm so thrilled that I, I was privileged to be asked to write um, a, a complete reference book on the state of the art, uh, on how to build better cities, how to sell into cities, you know, for academia, for vendors, for city leaders. Uh, so I wrote the book, Smart Cities for Dummies, came out in July. It's available all over the world, and it's on your screen now at smartcitybook.com. If you're interested in a signed copy, you'll you'll find a link there too, and, and we're offering um, anyone who attends this conference today a generous discount on that if you're interested. So thank you very much if you decide to go forward. Now, what I'd like to do is welcome our first incredible speaker. Uh, I'm going to welcome Cornelia levi Benchton. And uh, she's going to be giving a speech called Rebuilding Trust in Our Broken Systems. A little, I'll tell you just a little bit about uh, Cornelia. Uh, she's a communications strategy consultant and a writer. And I know her well. And I know her work well. She's incredible. Um, uh, her data-driven marketing and decision support work helps companies optimize their performance in the, in the face of change. And wow, aren't we going through a lot of change these days? Um, she's a principal of CLB Strategic Consulting, and her focus is on impact of disruptive technologies and associated cultural challenges that open up new opportunities, wow, and necessitate refresh strategies. Um, and she's a published author like myself, but I think uh, she's been at the game a lot longer than I have. <laughs> she's done very well in it. I'm so thrilled that she's here. I'm going to hand you over to Cornelia right now.
Hi, Jonathan. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. And like you, I'm here on the West Coast. Hello, everybody. It's a great pleasure and an honor to be here with you today. I'm Cornelia levy Benchton, and here's me in, with my fabulous co-author, Mike Barlow, in Barcelona, launching our book, Smart Cities, Smart Future, showcasing tomorrow. It was such an exciting experience, and it was really great to be in Barcelona, with this, which is the mother of all smart cities. By way of background, I like to use this hexagon, and it describes the key sections in a smart city economy, government, environment, living, people. Let's fix on a quick definition of smart city. Most people describe a smart city as citizen-centric or perhaps technology-enabled. I like to have another definition. Mine is this. It's a city where people can live the best life possible, live better and live smarter. In the words of the iconic writer, French writer, Voltaire, they can live le meilleur des mondes possible. Everything in smart cities was going wrong just fine, undisturbed. There were more cities, more larger and smaller. We were gaining momentum and there were more conferences and more participants. And it was all undisturbed until we hit the, the pandemic, which caught off us off guard. It was vast and it was furious. I saw an interesting article in the Wall Street Journal the other day, and the title was really fascinating to me. It was called The Long Shadow of the Pandemic. And I thought, how apt. It has really reverberated in a shocking way and touched all of us all over the world. I think the, path, the pandemic has had a cascading effect, a kind of domino effect across all of our tried and true institutions healthcare, education, safety, society, and government. And those have typically presented us with a sense of safety and security. The net result is the screen you see now leading to a breakdown of trust. I could speak volumes of this on this topic, but suffice it to say that there's hardly been any aspect of our society and our culture and cities that haven't been impacted by the pandemic. We've been shaken to the core. You remember first in healthcare, we recall the heroic actions of our frontline responders who at first lacked the protective gear and were, were without equipment, the PPE and the ventilators to really care for the people uh, who needed it. We were afraid to go to the hospital because we were afraid maybe we'd catch the disease. Also, we, if we had something, some surgery, we couldn't get the care because COVID was a priority. And I ask you, frankly, how many times during this crisis have you asked the, yourself the question, you had a little cough, is that COVID? Do I have it? Did I remember to wipe off those groceries for, that were delivered? We, during the period, we saw a tremendous collaboration, at least here in the United States, between the national and local governments. Uh, rather, rather wonderful, actually. Many examples of people, people working together and pulling through the crisis, because let's face it, we're in this together. But despite these collaborations and efforts to work together, there, were so, there was so much confusion, so much poor data, insufficient data, and conflicting information. The discomfort was there, the discomfort of not knowing anything really for sure. A little more transparency might have helped, a little bit more humility from the authorities, a little less authoritarian tone from the authorities. So in the words of Albert Einstein, who knew it best, we clearly need bold thinking, new thinking to pull us out of the crisis. We need innovation and creativity, something new, a fresh approach. Here, for example, I want to spend a little time on this slide. Uh, we do have the tools and the brain power to solve the problems that we're facing. 
here I did a recent project which was a deep dive into many companies, all kinds of companies, a range, not only hospitals and medical care, but academic institutions, call centers, banks, financial services companies. And they did, it was all about how people rose to the occasion and solved problems with tremendous amount of new approaches and all kinds of new applications. This is a company here, Rush Medical Center, that that converted uh, machine um, handwritten script messages at the front door and translated those into machine readable language for patients who needed care urgently. It was a remarkable, uh, quick project that showed how how we can you how we never before need such things as open source open source hardware open software and how we need platforms such as fireware for their powerful easy to use solutions here for example we have our schools another catastrophic situation where <clears throat> which has been shaken to the core. Across the United States, I see many, many examples of irregularities, lack of standards. It's really very chaotic. Can you imagine anything worse than having your children go through 2020, but face the same educational standards, graduation criteria, and before? My question is, is this going to mark this, the students of 2020 irreparably? Parents are greatly dissatisfied with distance learning. Now, here is a slide showing the PISA scores, the PISA rankings in math, science, and reading. Now, already here in the United States, we rank number 25, which is nothing to brag about. So we have a lot of work to be done even before the, uh, the prevalence of online learning and remote, remote learning in schools. I'm calling for an explosion of innovation and technology in the learning and development category. Online learning tools are really, really needed because this is not going away. People will be learning and doing things more and more online. Now, here's an example of innovation. I just love this company, it's Teo. It's a London company, and what they do is they use video game-like avatars for meetings, lessons, conferences, and it imitates what is in fact, what could be in fact a real life experience. So I say, why can't we use applications and tools like this as a way to connect with others and make online learning and remote learning fun, a fun experience for our kids. You can't say that putting a school textbook up online is going to be engaging enough for kids to learn their lessons. Our work routine, another impact across of the, of the pandemic across society is work. It's just never going to be the same with distance required, social distance. It's just become a fact of life that we can work at home, but it's not that satisfactory. Studies have shown that we need the interaction and the social contact that comes from having colleagues and working and talking with our colleagues about solving problems. We're much more productive that way. Our unemployment has been another aspect that has rocked society. We were at 20 million unemployed here in the United States in May. Now we're down to 12 million, which is not great, but we're on the men. Here's a great example of people showing support. These are workers in a company who are helping their colleagues distributing unemployment application forms to their colleagues. I have to tell you that here in the States, what happened was really shocking. The banking and government agencies were totally swamped by the number of unemployment applications. Systems were crashing all over the place. It was just terrible. People couldn't get through on the phones. It was very frustrating. And it showed the unprecedented demands on these systems and how archaic they were 
and in need of being updated. Here's an example I want to show of a solution to these kind of technology problems addressing legacy issues and legacy systems. This is a bank called OVO in Indonesia. They have a state-of-the-art digital payment system and they, they pulled out all the stops. They got ready and they, they, can, they established a public-private partnership with their government and they were able to distribute much needed claims and checks to people who were unemployed. They adopted a kind of a war room mentality. They introduced a dedicated task force. They reorganized and really got on top of the problem. And they got it done. They had a got to get it done attitude. And there were many, many, many corporate heroes, like in the studies that I was involved in recently, that pulled out all the stops and showed how people working together, understanding others, can solve problems using technology, especially data science. Another thing that has been rocked by the pandemic here in the States anyway is the political elections. We have terrible archaic voting systems and registration for voting systems here in the States. We have, uh, there was major disruption in a recent uh, small campaign, a small election in here in Queens in New York, uh, which took six weeks to recount and determine who won. But you can just imagine with a, with a national political uh, campaign for president next month, a couple of weeks away, what could happen if we have a recount problem? It's just a disaster. Here's all of the fears of recounts. It's uh, we have clumsily designed ballots and antiquated registration process. It's just really um, an unmitigated mess. Um, one of the things that we might consider, next slide, is a blockchain, which we have the technology to, to remedy some of these things. In fact, the state of Ohio and 10 other states are experimenting with blockchain and, in the hopes that its distributed ledger format and its non-centralized organization and its foundation of trust being un unhackable virtually will offer a high-tech solution to these situations which are which are so flimsy and, so, and make us so vulnerable in terms of voting we have we need models and where are they well there are models open source models e-government and sharing processes in case anybody doesn't know about estonia which is on the baltic sea it's one of the first examples of an e, a fully digitized e-government, and it has a, it's founded next on a blockchain-like platform. You can do anything in, that you need to do with the government in Estonia uh, on your smartphone. It's just remarkable. I think you can do just about anything, register for school, um, get caught up on driver's licenses or whatever you need. Except for one thing, I think you can't get married on a smartphone in Estonia. But who knows, they may very well be working on that too. Tel Aviv is another great example of a digital, digital application applied for people's good. It's, uh, you can do school registrations, very much like Estonia. It functions more like a startup than a real government. It's just terrific. And lastly, what presentation would be in, would be complete without mentioning the mother of all smart cities, Barcelona, where their Decidem or crowdsource platform is virtually an e-democracy. This one, Vinkless, is dedicated to the aging population and brings them into the mix. I want to introduce you and invite you to go check out Kate Middleton, Princess Kate of England. She had a wonderful photography contest, 30,000 entries, and she picked 100 very, very touching scenes that describe the whole story of the pandemic in human terms. I just love these slides of grandmas. To me, they're so real and so human. They emphasize the human aspect of what we've all gone through together.
And last, to rebuild, the pandemic has, explo has exposed many flaws, and some of them, of course, were there before. But today, I've selected a few examples of people working in technology, data scientists, practitioners, experts in open source, technology leaders, all of whom have implemented protocols and shared solutions across companies, countries, and continents. We should be encouraged to go forward as smart city leaders and be optimistic. We need to show, however, our sense of humanity in our smart cities challenges as we as we solve our big people smart city problems. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to be with you and stay safe. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Cornelia, so much. Uh, such important points. I, I wanted to sort of re-emphasize something uh, that you said a couple of times in your presentation. Uh, you know, certainly COVID uh, broke a lot of things, but I think what was most evident, it brought to the surface the things that were already broken. Uh, and if there's any silver lining, it's that, because now we can address them uh, head on. Uh, being also somebody who was passionate about education, I loved uh, that you discussed the importance of uh, education in our communities and some of the new tech that will help more and more uh, kids and adults connect online to learn important things. So thank you very much, Cornelia. I want to bring in uh, Peter Fatalnik. Um, he's going to be now speaking on smart cities emerging from the pandemic. I see a little uh, theme going on here. Uh, he is the Minister Councillor for Digital Economy Policies at the Delegation of the European Union to the United States. Um, uh, he has a long career uh, and long experience in the digital tech sector, and uh, notably in building industrial innovation strategies. And he helped the European Union to drive forward internet innovation policies. I probably speak about some of your innovations uh, to my classes when I teach at university, <laughs> Peter. So I'm looking forward to your presentation. Uh, it's great to see you again. I think we were on a panel just uh, about a week or so ago. So I'm going to hand it right over to you. and. Uh, uh, Go ahead. Look Thank forward. you. Thank you for having me. And Jonathan, indeed, so good to see you again and honored to serve on a panel again with you, which you moderate and I'm uh, bearing your competence. So I'm, I'm quite conscious that actually recently we both have spoken on this topic about smart cities. And there is a risk that I'm going to repeat myself. But then I thought that's OK. Because the right thing can never be said often enough, and the time for this conversation is indeed super pertinent. And the second reason why I think we should keep on repeating what we say is that I'm still not sure that a sufficient large number of city managers can see the big picture. Cornelia was showing us this slide about Einstein, and, and I think that's basically the message I want to repeat as well. City managers are smart people. They sit in their box, though. And their daily job is to run a city. So who will pull them out of this environment so they can have a look from the outside and see what really matters? And I think that's part of the job we have here and that's part of this conversation we are having here today. As I suggested in my title, I also won't like to start this conversation with uh, the word pandemic. And I guess now I can hear everybody thinking, oh no, that's the only word I don't wanna hear anymore. What good could come of that? So, but I, I think, and, and the rest of my presentation should be more positive and forward looking, but I think there are at least two massive opportunities I see emerging here. And the first one being, the pandemic has accelerated the use of digital technologies beyond what we could have imagined just a year ago. And trust me, I have been working in government for 20 years. We have done foresight ad nauseum, but none of it, so this coming and so this change coming. So I think there's also this positive element that businesses have changed their business plans. The public sector does a lot more in government and we ourselves upgraded our own IT and ourselves with new skills and different work patterns. The good stuff of that will stay. And that's a change we should be thankful for maybe. The second massive opportunity I see you coming is that governments start with their economic recovery investments. And this time we don't have to bail out banks, but the real economy. So this recovery package are infrastructure investment programs 
as governments, at least some of them, want to invest in the future economy and not simply restoring the past. So this is, and, and here is the good news for the cities, trillions of dollars and euros are being readied for investment in a digital and green infrastructure, not to rebuild the old one, the old world, but to build the future we want. Sitting where I am here now in Washington DC and it's a foggy day, and, and I assure you it's not tear gas or anything like that, I do sense that in fact there's little difference between America and Europe in pursuing this ambition. Europe wants to compete with America in the digital space too, but the objectives are fairly similar. So if we sense this opportunity, what, what should be the game plan or what should be elements of a game plan for a city right now? Uh, first, I think take note that there will be money or there is money, but from experience, we all know money is hard to get. So you need more, you need a vision. And a vision which uh, probably builds around messages such as efficient infrastructure, eco-friendly mobility, creativity and innovation, real productivity gains. I'm saying that very slow because we haven't seen any of that the last 20 years. Real productivity gains and a high quality of life. In practice, this means adopting a data-driven approach, cutting across silos with building applications on interoperable data models. A third element of uh, such a game plan should be that you need a project. Now here is the big risk cities may get, may get it wrong. Because the big consultancies and system integrators will come to you and suggest projects. You can eat what they propose or be a little bit smarter and push them towards your vision, what certainly I'm advocating for. Now what could be tenants of such a smart city project? Focus clearly, in my view, focusing on core digital infrastructures. Applications are easily built when you operate on a modern cross-sector open platform technology. Go for open source where you can. And you have heard that before from both Jonathan and Cornelia. Save license fees where you can. Who wants to spend money? Make sure you're not locked in by your vendors and ensure full data sovereignty and buy local. Also, don't think that your specs are unique, even if companies keep on telling you that. Go for off-the-shelf products and reuse software. Retain your flexibility to evolve specs without punishing contract terms. So I guess you do need a lawyer somewhere next around you who helps you putting that into, into a legal language. And remember, the one who pays should give the order. Now, Another element is make sure that you work with people, that you work with people on your project who live and work in your city. That's not much of a swipe towards other countries. Rather, that will ensure that you build in parallel an innovation ecosystem along with the technology investment. Keywords here are entrepreneurship, accelerators, social innovation, workforce talent, and skills. And again, I refer to what Cornelia has said, and I think Barcelona is a fantastic example about that local ecosystem uh, building. Engage with other cities. You can learn from others. We all do that on a daily basis. Cities should do the same. Fora, such as the Open Agile Smart City Initiative, help build that vision for an app store for city applications. And in summary, I would I would call this key, or I would just repeat a few of those key elements for smart city projects. Data sovereignty, interoperability, open APIs, transparency, portability, multi-cloud homing, and finally, demand from firms what you want. And thank God that's a market, thank God that's a market, in fact, where we still have competition. So shop around and don't compromise an inch unless it makes sense to you. Now, it's lovely to dispense such good advice. I'm sure you, you think something like that. But has Europe eaten her own dog food? Yes, she has. Here are examples of what support or in which way Europe has supported this, uh, this narrative in a tangible way. First, Europe, the European industry, in fact, has created fiber and opens 
source platform for smart services with a modern standardized open data model. With Fiverr, cities can achieve their transformation into a data-driven and innovative actor with minimum cost, yet great impact. It's important you note that by adopting these common standard APIs and information models, cities stay in charge of their data and push companies to compete for the services. Another line of action is that uh, Europe and all member states are doubling down on that vision for open and interoperable data environments. Just last week, all EU member states, member states signed a joint declaration of building a next generation of cloud in Europe. This follows a two-pronged approach, an investment program to bring cutting-edge innovation cloud technology into businesses and the public sector called GAIA-X, coming second with a rule book, which is a set of good cloud characteristics such as data production, cybersecurity, data portability, interoperability, transparency, openness, and of course, energy efficiency, performance, and reliability. So you hear my key words are kind of keep on coming up all uh, again and again. And finally, just this week on Tuesday, the European Commission has adopted its own open source software strategy. It's an internal strategy setting out a vision for encouraging and leveraging the transformative and innovative and collaborative power of open source, its principles and development practices. By that, it promotes a sharing and reuse of software solutions, a key element we have here in this whole conversation about fiber. Uh, and let me skip some parts of what I wanted to say. And coming to the end of, of my uh, intervention, finally, the new, European, uh, the new European Urban Initiative will replace several different instruments and actions in the area of urban policy we have had over the last 20 years, probably. There is no smart city program today anymore. Those times are long gone. Today, Europe pursues, like many other countries, a coherent approach which integrates smart cities with smart industry, smart rural areas, and smart citizen initiatives. The toolbox we are deploying here includes infrastructure investments and innovation. I mentioned that. But it's also talent and skills initiatives, starting from pre-K to schools to universities, but also maker spaces and vocational training. It includes, third, the tech research, innovation hubs, and startup communities. And finally, the element of cities partnering within their ecosystems, mayors and city managers, businesses, notably small innovation actors, such as universities and accelerators, and perhaps most importantly, citizen initiative can be a driver for, for that better future we hope to invest in now. To jumpstart this process, in a moonshot type of mission, the EU will turn 100 cities climate neutral by 2030. And 2030 is actually not that far away if you start planning and mapping it out. This means that we support and promote and showcase 100 European cities in their systemic transformation power to climate neutrality and digitization by 2030, and therefore turn these cities into experimentation and innovation hubs. I thank you very much, and I'm looking forward to the conversation to the rest of the presentation and, and, and to your questions. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. That was fantastic. One thing I've noticed in the uh, work we've done together, you fit a lot of rich information in a short amount of time. It's quite, quite amazing. I might have to look back at the video to catch some of the detail that you said. Uh, but I wanted to bring out a few points. Um, I always, I, I love how optimistic you are, despite the challenges we have right now. That's a very important message. There's a lot to be optimistic about. Let's not forget that. You're very future focused. Uh, I like that. And, and the one point which really resonated with me, having been a, a CIO and CTO on the city side, is you know when we're when we're eliciting uh, new products and, and trying to build the requirements, we're, you know we're not that special. You know uh, a lot of our requirements uh, are similar. So let's leverage and reuse requirements. I just had one quick question for you. You spoke about uh, the European Open Source Strategy. Is that something that uh, um, all of us can access? 
Yes, yes. In, in fact, it is an internal strategy. The European right. Commission, however, has been playing for the last 10 years a leader in e-government in Europe. So whatever the commission does is a bit of a showcase for the rest of, of governments and administration. That, uh, in, and I will happily share it in the, in, in the chat window, the link to, to that strategy. And the strategy also includes the use of fireware. Lovely, please do. I know for, for sure that I wanna read that and I'm sure lots of people do uh, today too. So thank you again, Peter. Um, I'm delighted to now bring on uh, Jason Widdett, who is the uh, Digital Innovation Lead at Amazon Web Services. And uh, now there's an innovative company. Uh, they're doing some incredible work uh, all around the world. Um, uh, uh, Jason was previously, he led the smart cities efforts for the 100 resilient cities at the Rockefeller Foundation, something I'm quite familiar with and I hope many of you are. And he held smart city roles at GE, ATT, and IDC Research. That's pretty incredible. And finally, Jason helped lead the Massachusetts Broadband Institute and the development of the $100 million mass broadband 123 fiber network and served as an Ameri AmeriCorps volunteer and in the Army National Guard. Wow, what a resume. That's amazing. Uh, Jason, I'll hand it over to you. Looking forward to your presentation. Great. Is my uh, screen up? It is. You can see it. Looks great. Thank you. Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, enjoying the conversation so far. Um, uh, uh, I think the question as it was posed to me was, uh, how is the data economy open innovation coming together? So let's see if we can have a little conversation about those. And first of all, thank uh, Jonathan for hosting us and Fiware. I'm sorry we're not all together at the summit in Spain, but hopefully next year definitely gives us something to, to look forward to. Oops. Hold on. So, um, a uh, couple quick things. I, you know, it's hard to do anything totally revolutionary in 10 minutes, but I think there's a couple key takeaways here. One, it is great to meet all of you, uh, and I hope you'll you'll connect in. Uh, if you like what I have to say, tell me. If you think I'm all wrong and crazy, tell me that too. But let's uh, use this time to keep the, the conversation going. Uh, and then the other thing, I want to give you just a couple thoughts uh, on the space. Uh, my short elevator pitch here is. Uh, I think as it's been mentioned a couple of times already, um, uh, the world is facing some really, really big, big challenges, uh, challenges that aren't going to solve themselves. And data is certainly uh, an element on that journey. And I think what we're seeing is the evolution as we move to a data economy from open data to something more robust and mature in data exchanges. Uh, and then the, the thing that's going to help us in this journey is building in more mechanisms that help take our great ideas and allow us to execute on them. So that's kind of the, if you, if you don't listen to any more of this, that's kind of my, my takeaway. Um, if you think about it, there's about 8 billion people in the world. I think we're right now 124 on this call. You're the people that have self-identified as caring about smart cities, as wanting to be a part of this conversation of showing up. Uh, how do we help you take all the brilliant ideas, all your energy, all your great intentions, and turn them into action? How do we help you execute? Um, that's a really important thing. And the, the, the trick here is to give you the mechanisms. You can have all of the most brilliant ideas, but if you don't have the tools, it's really hard to make big, impactful things happen. So I'm here, you can see in the background, I'm at the ASU Smart City Innovation Center. When you think of open innovation, uh, whether you call it an innovation center, whether you call it an incubator, an accelerator, uh, these centers are all over the world. And I think they're an essential mechanism to help putting in place the types of solutions uh, we need for the world. A couple of things that I wanna throw out, I think an important part of a really successful center, an important mechanism is to be open source, to be technology and vendor agnostic, to not be about a company pushing their wares, but about truly and honestly trying to work together. The way that we structure it here is with a great university, ASU. Uh, we've got an amazing uh, group of communities uh, Phoenix, Phoenix, you may know, is the fastest growing city here in the United States. Uh, and then Amazon Web Services, we bring our technology, but again, we're technology agnostic. Um, uh, the other thing that I think you need as a mechanism is to, to have some type of process that centers you on people, whether it's uh, human-centered design, whether it's design thinking. We use a process called working backwards. Um, it, 
you don't have to use this, but I, I would challenge you in your work to find a process you can use that allows you to bring people together, build consensus, and come up with strategies that, again, are not focused on the technology, but are focused on the problems you're trying to solve and the people that you are trying uh, to solve them for. Uh, something, a, a quick mechanism that I'll leave with you, take an idea that's in your head, something you're working on. Can you answer these five questions about it? If you can answer these clearly and concisely, you are probably on a really good track. Um, if, if it's unclear to you, if you have different answers coming up, uh, it's a good uh, point that you may have to go back and, and do some more work um, to, to really focus in your idea. But this again is another example of a really useful mechanism to help uh, move ideas forward. So moving from that first part mechanisms to uh, uh, to, to data exchange in the data economy. Uh, Jonathan, I think, said it, and I think Peter said it as well. Um, um, the world, this is a unique moment. The world has really, really big challenges. If you go forward to 2050, 2100, there are cities that are going to fail. They're going to fail for lack of water, too much water, lack of energy, lack of food, uh, a breakdown of social cohesion, and maybe they become too violent. Uh, the single biggest resource that any of us have is, is time. And if you look forward, those cities in 2100 or whenever day you want to pick, that are surviving and thriving are going to be the ones that use the time today to most shape their future. They make the hard decisions today. And data is going to be a powerful tool in helping to drive uh, those decisions. Um, let me skip ahead of this. And a way maybe to frame this is we think of this evolution towards the data economy. How can we improve our ability to collectively access and share the data we need to make big decisions about urbanization, globalization, climate change, these all these big problems that we're wrestling with? Um, today, open data, Jonathan, you write a, a lot about this in your book. You have great examples of open data. This is absolutely not critical of open data, but can open data be more? Um, I'm going to throw out a name. Ben Wellington comes to mind. Again, if we take 8 billion people in the world, the number of people who can truly use open data uh, to do uh, good things is, is small. How do we make data more accessible to more people? How do we allow people to self-service? And how do we structure open data to align to these use cases, these problems we're trying to solve? How do you look at some of the business processes that people work on, uh, whether it's transportation, public safety, uh, food security, and line up all of the data in one place to support that so that you're not having to in an ad hoc way run around and get the data and try and standardize it so uh, it's not that open data is bad i think we're going to evolve open data into uh, data exchanges and what data exchanges will help us do is tackle some of these these, these primary issues and opportunities with data how do we improve the, the completeness, the number, the, the accuracy of data? How do we ensure the public trust um, in data? It's really easy to lose public trust. Technology, smart cities, all of these things confuse people. Um, we have to collectively do uh, the most we can to ensure that we are uh, acting in the public good. So these are some of the challenges uh, with data. Uh, again, John, I'm going kind of fast just to, to kind of catch up. So what's the vision? I've said data exchange a bunch of times. Um, imagine if there was a data agency, a data utility that served as one repository for public data. So instead of every city having to go have their own open data portal, what if there was one that where people could retain the ownership, where it was owned not by a company, but by government, for government. It was transparent and people could have trust in it. Uh, but you didn't have to worry about the data integrity, data standardization. It was standard across all the different organizations. And it was really easy to access, to share, to layer on analytics and the other tools you need to make data actionable. That would be really powerful. And I think that's what we're gonna see, the evolution again from open data to this more robust data exchange. And that's gonna help both open up uh, the, the innovation, open innovation, as well as uh, facilitate the data economy and solving some of these really, really big problems. Um, so that's kind of the vision. 
can data exchange be a mechanism for this open innovation, solving these big problems? And the two really big things facilitate collaboration and allow us to focus on those specific missions and problems that we uh, need to prioritize uh, and tackle. Uh, here's a couple quick examples. There are tons of people working on, on data exchanges and advanced data projects. This is not a complete list, not endorsing any of these, just kind of examples if you want to look at some. US Knight uh, and Addis are working. Fiware is certainly doing great stuff. Um, the India Urban Data Exchange and what they've rolled out in Pune is really fascinating. Copenhagen uh, was a really early uh, use case. Uh, I'm sure the folks on this call can throw out a whole bunch more. Um, our action kind of steps. Uh, can we work to, to collectively to shape this vision of what a data exchange, what we need for infrastructure to go and support some of these uh, data-driven decision-making? And then what are the use cases that we want to start with? How do we go and say, hey, let's not just throw data out, but let's align it to use cases that will allow us to advance uh, uh, these projects that we need to, to prioritize. So that was my presentation. I, I tried to kind of catch us up a little bit on time, but run through that. Uh, if you've got questions or want to talk more about any of this, feel free to reach out. And uh, here's my contact information. And with that, thank you so much. And hopefully see you guys all at the next uh, uh, Fireware Summit. Uh, really cool, Jason. That was quite the quite the sprint. Uh, but uh, a lot of very rich information. Uh, I think what you presented there, we could have spent uh, an hour on, so perhaps we'll, we'll have you back uh, just to do that. Um, I liked a lot of what you said. Uh, those five questions are so essential, you know, and, and, and particularly the one that jumped out to me is, are the benefits clear? You know, let's really focus on that. Um, you, I'll give you a quick story. I joined, you know, the, 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 the city of Palo Alto uh, 10 years ago, and uh, yeah. Like many city leaders, when when I joined, uh, you know, I I, re I recognized very quickly that it was a world of constraints and limitations. You know, there was never enough time, never enough money, uh, didn't have enough talent, uh, and yet there was you know so many issues. But the one thing we had in abundance was data. We had a lot of data. Uh, we just weren't leveraging it. You know, and and as I look at cities all around the world, um, who just in the act of being a city, uh, collect, create, you know, and use data. So it's time for us to step it up, step up our game like you're suggesting and really uh, leverage the value of data in our communities. So thank you very, very much for a great presentation. I'm now going to uh, 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 transition to uh, Paul Wilson, um, who is the uh, chair in the, on the advisory board for Smart Cities World and a senior advisor at UK 5G. Um, Paul's presentation today is called Creating an Open Programmable City. And just the name itself is really uh, intriguing to me. I can't wait to hear about it. Uh, a little bit more about uh, Paul. Um, he's an honorary research fellow at the University of Bristol's Smart Internet Lab. And he's more than 25 years of international leadership, sales and marketing experience in the business-to-business uh, -business technology media telecom sector, including being the CMO of the Global Digital Transformation Association, TM Forum, and the three billion dollars SunGuard financial systems. Um, I've met Paul a few times and um, I think a lot of us, including myself, have been very impressed with what the city of Bristol has been doing. Um, very much a standout smart city uh, community. So really looking forward to your presentation, Paul, and I'll hand it over to you. Thank you very much. That's great to hear. So um, we've heard a lot about cities in the context. I think it's worth just repeating this, and then I'll get into some more technical details in a minute, but 71% of the Earth's covered in water, 3% by cities. But these cities consume 75% of the world's energy, and they drive 80% of greenhouse gases. They also make 85% of the global economy. So if you're interested in policy, running cities is a pretty important place to do that. Furthermore, about half of us, the whole world's population live in a city today, but that gets to about 70% by the middle of the century. And at the same time, the population of the world goes from seven to nine billion. So some people say an area the size of Australia will be urbanized by the middle of the century. So many of us are very familiar with the sustainable development goals of the United Nations. And we care about it. We're really interested in making sure we contribute to this uh, progress. A lot of 
support for these goals. However, there is a but. And the but is historically, cities have been very focused on their physical environment. And cities are extremely skilled at managing physical environments. They're skilled at looking after roads, buildings, planning permission, waste, all of these things. They're not particularly well skilled for digital asset management. And a lot of the people who run our cities, who are democratically elected into our cities, are not particularly skilled in the digital economy. One reason why, perhaps, is just that you don't get paid enough to work in the public sector as you could in the private sector if you're a digital skilled employee. So the fact of the matter is there are plenty of naysayers working in cities all over the world who are not sure at all about the wisdom of us getting into digital asset management or digital infrastructure. And here in the UK, we've had the rather shocking experience of 130 different masts, uh, communication masts being burned this year in an attempt to hit out against 5G. Um, believing to be some link between 5G and COVID. This is a particularly, you know, very peculiar situation that we're in. However, everyone on this call, I think, can see that if we want to do something about those sustainable development goals, we probably need to use technology to help. And uh, I think over the years of doing this, there's a lot of different aspects to this subject but i think most of it can be found in this this triangle here so people at the bottom people at the core of a city people make up a city and cities are the original platform economies that bring people together to trade to learn to teach each other to enjoy each other to care for each other cities are platforms that's their very nature in that context we've built infrastructure the physical infrastructure that i mentioned and the city is quite good at managing that physical infrastructure. The next thing it needs to do is to create a digital infrastructure with which to interact with the physical infrastructure. And historically, the comms industry has been very good at delivering, you know, five nines and reliable services, perhaps less good at creating flexible, uh, scalable, virtualizable, autonomous IT, ICT infrastructure. So what we see in the whole push for 5G is the idea of creating uh, networks built in software that, that can be any G, doesn't really matter about the G, that actually provide the connectivity and the edge computing that will help the infrastructure become programmable. The network itself can be uh, change, changing on demand through the edge. We see this rolling out in Japan with Rakuten, we see it uh, in India with Reliance Geo, and we see it uh, increasingly going up the, the to-do pile of all operators everywhere. This will be a truly disruptive innovation to the communications industry, and it will be like unblocking the pipes uh, of the house to allow connectivity and edge computing virtualized computing infrastructures to work on demand to support citizens. It takes us into the realm of asking questions about neutral hosting. Is it sensible that the public sector plays a role in infrastructure management or is that a silly idea? It sees a, a sort of a difference between the B2B services that can be provided over those hyperdynamic infrastructures. In smart cities terms, we've often seen many cities opening up real data, as Jason talked about, and, uh, and then moving from those static open data platforms to real-time data, data platforms, and as he talked about, data exchanges, a digital platform model, a multi-sided model that allows different stakeholders to engage. That opens up an enormous can of worms for governance between public and private sector. And some cities are further ahead in their ability to manage that than others. And those who've got it begin to be able to create that public-private 
big company, small company ecosystem to be able to interact on top of uh, the, the governance model that's managing that data. So with Bristol, TM Forum, Fireware, um, uh, UK 5G, there are then examples around the side here of things that we have been working on over the years that are pushing this whole agenda forwards from the IoT API component suite for managing different IoT services to the partnership on APIs between Fireware and TM Forum towards data model harmonization uh, on um, uh, using some of the industries, the telco industry's main data models to create a standardized data model for cities. I wouldn't say it's a done deal, it's a done job, but actually some of the biggest brains worldwide have been collaborating around that already. Then a smart city benchmark model, so you can see your own progress against that. Particularly useful for bringing different stakeholders together. And in city smart city projects, stakeholder management is indeed a big challenge. How do you bring the police together with the university, with the business community, with the local government, with the ambulance? Uh, and how does that governance work? We put some of the principles of that together in a city as a platform manifesto looking at how public sector and private sector can collaborate to build some of these things together. And more than 150 people signed that from the United Nations to uh, Huawei to Nokia Siemens to Dubai uh, and cities in America like Atlanta. And then we look at um, a smart city operating map, different kind of process languages and a way of managing digital ecosystems because it's complex when you have multiple different players Who's, who is responsible for when part of a chain fails. And so we have tools uh, for, for managing digital ecosystems. Okay, gone through that slowly. I'm now gonna go through very rapidly through a whole bunch of things which show how we applied this in Bristol. We created our own digital infrastructure in the city, the council owned ducting. So the red line, and this is a map of Bristol, is fiber in the ground. We put a mesh network across the city using the city's um, lamp posts. We put experimental radio into the harbour side, which is where all the red stuff is in the middle. We upgraded our planetarium to become a data dome so real live data could be shown and interacted with. We plugged it into the high performance computer at the University of Bristol so we had a very high processing engine. We created um, a city operating system that was a, could slice the network. Uh, and allow it to give the resources, virtualized resources needed on demand around the network and to the end applications. Then, because we had that infrastructure, it allowed us to run a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, I'll whiz through it fast. Ver uh, autonomous cars and uh, driverless cars. So we were able to do vehicle to infrastructure experiments on autonomous cars. It allowed us to try IoT devices in people's housing, which were too damp because the living conditions were poor and landlords didn't care. But when these green frogs were put in people's houses, they gave data to the residents who could then write to their landlord and say, this is the fact about how damp it is in this house and you need to repair it according to public health laws. And landlords suddenly took note because they knew they were being monitored with data, whereas previously, it ignored their, their tenants. We opened up data, uh, 218 data sets. We uh, began to visualize data from across the city inside the data dome, uh, as I said, and we created a very uh, beautiful uh, and attractive environment, which hundreds and hundreds of people came and were excited to see what went on in there. And that was plugged into the high performance computer up at the university so we could actually change modeling on the fly. We used air quality sensors to track air quality across the city. We found that five people's deaths a week in Bristol were linked to poor air quality. Bristol, a city of about seven, 800,000 people. So quite a significant linkage between air quality issues. And during this year, COVID time, we see a radical um, closing of roads in the center of town and opening up new cycle routes um, to help tackle this program. But the program has been backed up by the data provided by the air quality sensors. So it's hard for many road users want to complain, but there is solid data that's being used to uh, stand up to them. 
we began to look at using uh, Internet of Things to support elderly people, people over 80. 5% or 1 in 20 of people in the UK is over 80 years old and an aging population is set to, to grow even higher. So we began to use, with obviously with permission of those involved, IoT sensors in their house to provide more uh, intense care environment for people. We brought innovative, creative people in to play with digital games in the city, getting citizens to play on their phones, to play actually with the street lights in the city and create all sorts of engaging, interactive uh, stuff in the city. We began to look at 5G in terms of creative industries, particularly big in Bristol. And we have here, for example, you can see people using wireless VR headsets. So they're actually all on a synchronized dance. They can't see each other, we can see them, but they don't know what each other's doing and they're all following a ballet. And uh, you can see how quickly the group is acting together uh, in the ballet. You might ask, why are we bothering? And the point <laughs> was to show the speed of the latency into a VR headset wirelessly in the center of town. We, um, to put augmented reality into the Roman baths in Bath uh, and improve tourism experience uh, there. We've been doing work on robotics with composites, uh, including a 5G factory uh, manufacturing environment and like many others we have used some of that to improve our operations center with police fire ambulance and the council now sharing shared operations center i'm so excited in a minute to see rio de janeiro's because theirs just tops everyone's absolutely phenomenal i've been looking at the rio de janeiro operations center for years so delighted to have them on this call but ours is uh, ours is that like nice little one but uh, we'll be blown away when we compare it with rio's so if we come back to the overall model here, what we saw is um, we've worked to tackle these issues. Fireware has been an important part of that. Autonomous networks are an important part of that. There are many angles to this topic. Stakeholder governance is one. And here are some of the organizations that have been providing the uh, standards work that we've used from the open APIs from TM Forum and Fireware, to UK 5G, which now has a 30 million pound funded smart city project in Birmingham, West Midlands 5G, to Synchronicity, which again has used Fireware and TM Forum to create data model, shared data markets for IoT, and of course the Catapult network. So lots going on. I have absolute confidence that we're gonna get there because um, the forecasts show that the spending on IT as a proportion of the world economy will move from 5 to 10 percent this decade. Vodafone suggests there'll be a 158 billion boost to the UK economy by 2030 because of 5G. Absolutely huge. Connecting Europe facility working closely with Fireware on uh, rolling out all those stuff. So as Peter talked about the 100 cities, that's all part of that program. And I'm inspired by what goes on these days at Microsoft to talk about reinventing a company to create tech, tech intensity. And I think they've really understood the whole uh, scene going from software through the cloud now into infrastructure through to programmable uh, infrastructure and IoT. So that's my, uh, that's my, my, my pitch. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Paul. Uh, wow, I'd love to go deep into every one of those examples uh, because I think we could all learn uh, a lot. Um, of course, like a lot of people, I think I was struck by the uh, the use case of, of uh, the frogs, uh, the frog little IoT device in people's buildings to detect uh, dampness and then uh, hold landlords accountable. A uh, great practical example of how um, you know, connecting our cities and using data can be a real game changer in people's lives. Um, I also noted that, you know, for a city to be a platform, what you described in one of your images around uh, having the fiber and the mesh network, it's really important to have a digital infrastructure because once you have that in place, you can layer on top of it so many uh, important features like you, uh, you gave examples. But most of all, what I thought was interesting was in some of your pictures, uh, how much fun people were having. Uh, people were interacting and engaging 
in their cities. And we absolutely know that when communities uh, engage together and they are involved in city activities, uh, people are happier, uh, the communities are more prosperous, um, and it's a it's a win-win all around. So a, a big lesson there just in, in that alone. So thank you so much, really wonderful work and congrats on, on all the amazing work in the city of Bristol. It's really a, a tremendous uh, model for, for success for others. Um, now I'll transition to um, um, Wanho Herero, who is the CTO of the Fireware Foundation. So my guess is he knows one or two things about what Fireware is and how it works. And he's going to be doing a presentation called Unleashing the Potential of Real-Time Open Data, Enabling a Data Economy in Cities. Uh, he's currently the CTO, as I said, and he's the chairman of the Fireware Technical Steering Committee. So um, uh, I imagine it's gonna be quite technical, this presentation, which is cool. And he also supports the Fireware community in developing the vision and value proposition of Fireware in the several domains where it's been applied, including the future of cities. So really cool to have you here and I'm looking forward to this. I'll hand it over to uh, Juan Ho. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, um, thank you all the attendees of uh, this great uh, Fireware Day we have today. Okay, um, Fireware definitely is supporting cities all around the world in their digital transformation journey evolving through different levels of maturity with the ultimate goal of improving the daily life of not just citizens, but also business operating in cities, making them more productive, better places to work. First two steps in this journey have to do with enabling a more efficient governance of the city by means of breaking information silos that in many cities still exist all collaborating together towards creation of a sustainable market of interoperable and very important replicable smart city solutions which is what will make the smart cities market sustainable over time fiber brings here a genuine approach based on providing the key standards for creating a digital twin representation of the city the status the context of the city implemented as a collection of digital twin entities representing the streets, the buses, the shops, even citizens, all together given a description about what's going on in the city in real time. Leveraging on this digital twin representation, supporting a system of systems vision, the different systems in the city can both publish and consume digital twin data through a standard API that is NGSI LD. And furthermore, leveraging on common data models shared by multiple cities. This way, its system is being able to bring smarter functions with data published by other systems they can exploit. And overall, we are able to merge all these data to support city level governance solutions which are capable to extract and exploit those insights which were hidden when systems were working as information silos but i'm not going to talk today so much about these first two steps but actually the two last ones in this transformation journey because that was precisely the title of the event today how to transform cities into platforms for open innovation and creation of a data economy. How a city uh, uh, may become an instrument for open innovation. Well, data certainly has to play a very important role in that respect. Um, because data is what ultimately fuel innovative services that some may argue well, that is what we have been doing with open data initiatives for so many years, and this has not really that much delivered the promise. Well, perhaps because those data which were uh, published were lacking a four cornerstone characteristics. First of all, the right time nature of the data, because right time data, real time data is which will health development of those kind of services that really impact the daily life of people. Harmonize data models, because otherwise 
the concept of developing once for multiple cities cannot be achieved, and that is a barrier for investment by the startups and SMEs we want to engage as drivers of open innovations within the city. Proper access control and mechanisms for identity management are also relevant. And last but not least, the ability for developers to provide feedback on published data. Fiverr is bringing response to all these aspects, enabling these four characteristics and the concrete components that are helping to extend existing data publication, open data publication platforms like CCAN with uh, the capacity to incorporate and export and publish right time open data sets that can, developers, third parties can use for creating this kind of services. All supporting uh, access control by means of integrating uh, uh, the um, state-of-the-art standards in security and access control like, like OAuth or XACML. Last uh, step in the journey has to do with creating this um, uh, data economy and here uh, a city has to realize in the first place that despite it holds a lot of data it managed a lot of data describing what's going on in the city. It's not the whole set of data that really could uh, describe what's there uh, happening uh, uh, at at right time. There is a lot of data describing what is going on in the city that is in the um, uh, in the side of private sector of the banks of the retailers, telecom operators many private companies which we have to bring the incentives to share the data and what best incentive uh, could be for this than being able to monetize the data so what is bringing fiber here is the ability to um, allow these third parties to expose data but get some return on that investment um, here fiber is bringing also concrete technology, concrete response, enabling to evolve existing up right time and open data platforms into data marketplaces where not only the city but third parties can expose data and create multi-site markets that will enable the true open innovation that, uh, that the cities um, uh, are capable to support. This leads to a uh, target reference architecture, which is the kind of reference architecture that Fiverr promotes and um, 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 offers to the cities. Again, with the context broker technology component in the core center of the architecture, enabling the systems within the city uh, to uh, interchange data, but uh, also exposing part of this data to uh, third parties through these data marketplaces and enabling those third parties as well be able to enrich this digital twin representation of the city with new entities or perhaps uh, new properties uh, uh, of our existing entities for the sake of uh, better uh, uh, insights and um, the ability to create um, more informed decisions. My last slide um, to kind of also make it uh, a bit more concrete, I wanted to um, elaborate about a project we are going to initiate which we believe is going to be great and is going to be uh, uh, bringing um, um, a lot of uh, um, a reference among developers. We are planning to create a global fiber data marketplace instance, which would be leveraging on OpenStreetMap map data and support the publication of right time data that enrich the existing information in OpenStreetMap with right time open data sets uh, served by context broker hosted in the smart city platforms of cities that wishes to uh, that wish to participate in this initiative, but also price data sets. Why not uh, uh, at least start piloting this concept with 
the involvement of companies of the private sectors or even individuals who may wish to share part of the data they may have in sensors in in the in their homes in the in their yards uh, etc a distributed architecture for global access federated context brokers um, uh, bringing support to dashboards uh, to the end users and of course uh, having to deal with uh, data governance overall but trying to create a true a truly um, you know effective and uh, and wonderful useful uh, resource for developers connecting to the smart data models initiative um, i provide there the links for uh, the smart data models initiative on github on the web i really recommend you to take a look at the webinars we are running on wednesdays elaborating how we are um, uh, driving definition of data models uh, in different sectors uh, around this initiative. And the goal would be, together with this power data marketplace, uh, reuse curated uh, data models, incubate new data models and create existing ones. And well, we have uh, just started with some challenge ahead, but um, 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 act, uh, call to action to, to everyone in this call in the community to join us in this uh, quite interesting uh, project. And that is all. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you uh, so much for uh, your great presentation and, and the quick overview. Uh, there's a lot of detail uh, in there that uh, uh, we'd like to get into, but uh, I did notice on the Fireware website uh, a lot of content uh, that you talked about is there and ready for people to access. So, so thank you uh, very much for that. And thanks for the work you do to develop out uh, Fireware uh, as an open source global platform. Uh, very much appreciated by, I think, our communities and increasingly so in the years ahead. Um, so thank you. Uh, one other question that's come up a few times is, will there be access to the PowerPoints? Um, the, the PowerPoints won't necessarily be shared uh, other than the individual sharing them, uh, but this is all being recorded and will be accessible on the Fireware channel on YouTube, so you can reference it as you, as you see fit. Okay, so what we'd like to do now is to jump into just a few short questions, because um, we have some questions coming in, plus some others. Um, and I'll start with just a quick one here. This is for Paul, for you, Paul Wilson. Um, you mentioned a um, a smart city benchmark uh, tool or document. Uh, could you where where can people find that? If Paul is still there. Yeah, I'm still here. Absolutely. Sorry, sure. just turning my camera on. Yeah, um, you can get it through a few places. Um, if if you're in the states, you might want to do it with leading cities. Leading cities use it. Uh, if you're in Europe, you might want to work with the Future Cities Catapult. They also do it, and you can do it with TM Forum as well. Uh, what it does is it's it's sort of free, um, so that's nice. But mm -hmm. um, you might do better in using it if you have somebody who knows how it works hold your hand. And um, both the Leading Cities and Future Cities Catapult will happily help you do that. It's a really great way to bring together different stakeholders within a city and then benchmark readiness um, and get a sort of heat map. One of the things we found was that every different part of the city, they've all heard of smart cities, they're all got a plan. But what smart city means to one part of the city and what it means to another part of the city can be completely different. And you've got a lot of enthusiasts who like to say things like AI and blockchain and digital infrastructure and data. So everyone loves to throw these phrases around, which is really nice, but what on earth are you talking about? And so uh -huh. um, a maturity model helps everybody kind of um, throw up all of their excitement about these things and the fact that they know something about some of these areas. And then it helps everybody see that actually there are many pieces to this jigsaw and where do we need to develop a plan? And it helps you set a two-year plan, which we thought was um, two years is not one year, so it's not just a crazy rush, but three years sounds like something you can can ignore for a while. So we set helps you build a two-year plan. 
Great, thank you. And I want to have you, uh, just a follow-up question here from another participant. Um, the model of the programmable city, and particularly the, the Bristol approach uh, that you presented, has that been used in other cities in the UK or even uh, broader? The programmable aspect really relates to the digital infrastructure. So what we did in Bristol back uh, 2015, really, we rolled that out, is now being deployed in communications industry at some scale. Although this is quite hard for the comms industry to do because they're heavily invested in hardware-oriented network infrastructures. So what you see happening in network infrastructures is the newcomers, and I mentioned Rakuten in Japan and Reliance Geo in India, are kind of newbies on the scene and they've got the advantage of not having installed very legacy hardware at great expense and they've been able to come with a, a new cloud native approach to their networks. And the whole comms industry is sort of looking to these two companies, which in India, Facebook and Google have invested. And uh, the Rakuten is, is, is quite astonishing what's going on there. Because one, once you create that cloud-based network, you create the fluidity of connectivity and virtualized computing on demand by the edge. And that is almost what we need to bring a lot of the vision that many of us have shared around smart cities to life. And the next question that will always come to this is about governance. Whose data? Who's in charge? Is this just a way of making money for private sector? Is this more state surveillance for the government? So that question of uh, governance is a really important topic. Uh, and you see some academic institutes around the world thinking about that. But I I'm, I'm like, would like to see more thinking about that because it's big stuff and it's quite complex. And I don't think we've matured enough yet to quite know how to manage all of that yet. Yeah, yeah, such a good point. I, I, I will be the biggest champion for you on the, on the governance uh, question, really talk about that a lot, yeah. so critical. Yeah, um, it, it's a big deal. Yeah, it really is, yeah. For others, uh, other speakers, there's some questions coming in. If you want to just answer them in the chat, that would be great so everyone else can see the answers. Uh, that that would those some some neat uh, questions on different aspects of the different speakers. I do have a question for Cornelia, if you're there, if you're still with us and and you're available. Sure. Hi. How are you? Hey, Cornelia. <laughs> a question for you here. Yes. Um, you touch on a on a, a very important topic: the importance of human centric solutions. Um, and you seem to very much value the human aspects of technology. Yes. Um, could you could you elaborate a bit on what they are and, and why it's important for us to focus on those? Yes, I like to I like to describe it in in terms of marketing. We always say in marketing, customer first, customer centricity, and by the same token, in a city, putting the citizens first, making this making it citizen centric. And I think it's very important because if in, in marketing, if you put the city, the company, the citizen first or the, the client first, you always have a business. So if you are in a smart city and you put the, the, the citizen of the city first, you can be sure that you're solving the problems of the, of the basic component of the city, which is the citizens. So that's my understanding and how I like to talk about it. Does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. That's fantastic. Uh, let's see. Uh, I, I feel I want to do one more question, and I'll uh, direct this one at Peter Telnig. I see you there, Peter, on video. Uh, so here, here's the question for you. Uh, a, a smart city is one that engages its citizens and connects with its infrastructure digitally, applying new technologies to address challenges such as urban mobility. However, these technologies need to work together seamlessly and benefit citizens, as well as respect democratic values diversity and citizens' digital rights. Hmm. How exactly can cities move from smart cities to innovation hubs, especially now that COVID-19 has taken over some other priorities that cities should be looking at? There is a big question for you. That's a super big question. And I think there are there are probably a couple of ways of addressing that. One, one I think is uh, when, when I've had years back a conversation with city managers is, 
they felt all the responsibility on them. That's not necessarily true. So a mayor can go out and engage in a conversation with citizens of how to go about that. A lot of people willing to help and chip in with knowledge, with expertise on how to build out an ecosystem, a digital ecosystem. So don't feel that you need to have the answer. Others may help you in building it. And from there, actually, the, the really, and what I have seen, again, we come back to Barcelona, is building citizens' initiatives. The, pe people are happy to, to, to build real things and, and to be part of this transformation process. So do leverage that creativity and innovation power you have among the citizens. Uh, to a certain extent, you can now say, you can do the same with the smaller businesses. This is this is also what many people, uh, many cities do. Build out innovation zones, for instance, in some part of the city where they say, "Look, we all want to sort of put that here. There we allow a bit more experimentation. This is an area where we want to play more with technology and then test that and test drive many of them. So that's another approach you can see in there. Many cities have taken a sectorial approach. Uh, we spoke a lot about Bristol. Bristol is is a hub of the creative media industry in Europe. So Obviously, you build out a creative media ecosystem and say, well, you know, if can we go further in that specific technology? So I, I'm not sure if I can exhaustively answer that, that question, but I, I think it's looking at the assets you have as a city, and citizens are certainly your first asset to, to address there, but then also the others, and try to see, and, and probably you apply different avenues and, and trying to see how, how you can engage a conversation and action into this. Very, very good question. Thank you. Sure. And, and of course, always a great answer. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, so what we're going to do now, we're going to jump into a use case. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one a lot um, because over the years, I've uh, much like Paul and Bristol, I've, I've read a lot and seen videos of Rio's work. But now we hear from the source and, and we see it in the background there, which is fantastic. Um, so I'd like to bring in um, Pedro Martins and Marcus Marconi, um, and they're going to be speaking about uh, Rio de Janeiro uh, open innovation and control centers as platform for smart cities. Uh, Pedro Martins is the planning manager at the Centro de Operations in Rio, and Marcus Marconi is the founder and CEO of VM9. Um, I could tell you more about them, but we really want to hear what they have to say, so I'm going to hand you over to the guys right now. Thank you. So hello everyone, hello Jonathan. Uh, it's an honor for us to be here sharing our vision uh, towards how urban command and control centers can play an important role in smart city building. So uh, let's start from the beginning. Rio de Janeiro Operation Centers, uh, which from now on I will call it CORE from the Portuguese abbreviation, right? C-O-R. So CORE is the city operation headquarters since 2011. Uh, covering urban infrastructure, urban logistics, and also urban emergencies. So, CORE covers these three main areas by gathering more than 30 city services that are directly involved with these three main areas. In our daily basis, we use database tools in order to monitor risks, to monitor city indicators, uh, to program automatic alerts, and many other uh, operational tasks that we need to do within this uh, control room. So, because of that, we turned into, we became a kind of a, a data hub, right? So it happens with all, with other uh, city control centers worldwide. And for us, it's very important because we need data, we need data tools in order to do a job. So this is the software, this, this situational map up there is the software in which we gather all data sources that we have access. It's called GeoPortal. And this is another one, it's an open innovation, uh, uh, open innovation, I'm sorry, open data platform called Data Rio. So these two platforms, Data Rio and GeoPortal, are the two main open data platforms managed by uh, Rio City Hall. In this, slides, uh, in this slide here, I illustrate why we innovate, right? So innovation for core is a necessity. We need to innovate, to innovate in order to enhance our performance to deal with this kind of situation and events that you were watching this slide. So we uh, we innovated since the beginning of, of our operations, but from 2018 on, we, we, we decided to make a next step in innovation being more aggressive in terms of open innovation strategy. So we launched the core innovation program, which is our effort to build uh, an innovation agenda in order to transform our control room 
in the living lab for smart city solutions. And we did that based on four pillars. These four pillars are four strong elements that we already have them running uh, within a cultural in order to allow us to, 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 to have a great performance in delivering our services, operationally speaking. And what we try to do is to put these four elements to point them for innovation proposals. And we strong, strongly believe that we can achieve a, a relevant results by doing that. So let's go to these four elements. So the first one is city problems knowledge. So as we talk here, my friend here right behind me is facing city problems, right? So we do this in a 24 basis. So we have a huge knowledge about city problems, which facilitates a lot the demand for surgical uh, solutions, right? So the second element is city experts. City experts are already gathered within our control room because of uh, to to, in order to, to make planning sessions for uh, uh, crisis operational responses and many other uh, scheduled uh, meetings. So why don't we use them? We engage them also to act like mentors for innovation proposals. Third element, I just mentioned in it, is the city data, data hub. So we are a data hub. We need data to, for operational purposes. So why don't we use this data also for hackathons and other innovation programs? And the fourth element, one of the most important, is the city toolboxes access. Let me explain that. So uh, every agency has its own toolboxes in order to make whatever they need to do in the field, right? Whatever uh, uh, intervention that they need to do in the field, uh, uh, they, they, they use the, their own toolboxes. As all these agencies are gathered within four, uh, it means that core has access to all these toolboxes. So it, make, it makes for us much more easier for us to make any kind of intervention, like uh, installing a hardware or testing any kind of solution in the field. So uh, uh, based on these four pillars, we started to organize open innovation challenges. And from 2018 to now, we had organized two innovation challenges. And these are some outcomes, first outcomes that we have out from these challenges. So uh, we had two certified solutions you're seeing the screen. So from conception, to go to market first steps, we took like six months, which showed us that these four pillars concentrated in one um, uh, innovation ambient uh, are really powerful in order to boost, to accelerate the product and solution development process. And in the end of the, these two open challenges, these two uh, certified solutions were already running within a control room, uh, helping our colleagues here to do their job. So on your left, you see a street flooding sensor developed by Noah Smart City. It's, it's a startup, and I'm talking about uh, hardware generating more city debt, right? You on the left side, you see VM9 uh, startup icon. My friend Marcos, uh, uh, in a few moments, will explain a little bit more about their, their solution. But they develop a platform that gather data in order to enhance our capacity to manage uh, the, the local bus system. So. Our intent here is to keep consistently developing more solutions, more smart city solutions, using our control, control center to boost it, to make it faster, right? So what we are seeing here in Rio is that as we develop more and more solutions, we are pushing the city, we are pushing the city managers to build a, a better data standards and also to build a more harmonized data models. And at the end of the day, by developing smart city solutions within our control room, we are doing a, a straight contribution for the birth of a local data economy. So these are the first outcomes of our innovation program. We're trying to build the whole experience towards how we use city command and control centers as platforms for smart city building based on these four pillars that I mentioned. So city problem knowledge, knowledge uh, city data hub, city experts as members, and straight access to city two boxes. And just to mention an European uh, example, I participated uh, a few years ago in a visit to one of the most important uh, control centers in Madrid called CISEN. I interviewed CISEN managers and I saw, I myself saw uh, these four elements running over there in their control room in the same way that we have here uh, uh, in, in, in core. So uh, what I'm saying that what I'm bringing for you today, what I'm presenting for you today has a great uh, potential to be replicated in other cities worldwide. So right now, I will pass the, the, the word to my friend Marcos that will show a little bit more how his startup was able to develop a product within our uh, innovation engine. Marcos, it's over to you.
Okay, thank you, Fredo, for the, the introduction. Um, okay, Rio is the second most populous city in Brazil, with nearly 7 million citizens. And regarding mobility, it has about 5,000 buses on the streets every day that account for 75% of Rio's public transport. As a worldwide concern, Rio is also vulnerable to severe weather events. And talking about the Open Innovation Program launched by CORE, as Pedro said, the last edition was related to how to mitigate the impact of the climate change on Rio bus service. Important to note here that all the data needed for the challenge comes from the Rio's open data portal, Data Rio, and CORE's data hub. VM9, a gold member of, of the Fire Foundation, attended the challenge proposing to bring fire technologies to improve the city monitoring. Using Fire Context Broker, we connected several, uh, several real time data sources to boost the capacity of handling events from harmonized data models and open standards. So the final solution is based on a creation of a real-time KPI that combines a set of variables such as bus speeds, occupation of the roads, rain level, city events as accidents, roadblocks, police operations, and others. This KPI measures the status of the bus service as it becomes progressively worse. It starts from 0% when traffic is in normal conditions and can scale up to 100%, indicating maximum deterioration. The KPI is calculated for each specific avenue of the city. In other words, each avenue has its own KPI. From the monitoring of this real-time indicator using artificial intelligence and statistical process control, this solution is able to identify trend patterns and trigger early warnings to the operation room, allowing CORE to perform in a more predictive way. And here, there is an interface of the solution monitoring an avenue of the city. It is possible to observe maps, online cameras, gauges about speed, rain, city events, statistical process control charts, and others. It's all integrated. The solution has several dashboards related to the operation and planning of the public transport. It's a portable solution and it's ready to be deployed to other cities around the world, as we have started doing in Brazil. To conclude, all of this has great value for many economic sectors, for logistics and insurance companies, for example. The next step is related to deepen into the data economy concepts in order to monetize APIs and promote the sustainability to the whole data ecosystem that makes this kind of solution a real benefit to the traffic management, climate change mitigation, and for sure, the society. Thank you. Very nice indeed, very, very cool. Uh, impressive work you're doing there and, a, and a, an amazing model for the rest of the world. And one thing I want to point out, people might not realize, Pedro is not in front of a green screen. If I'm not mistaken, he's actually in the uh, uh, the center itself, the operation center. He's sitting in the operation center. How about that? If that's not cool, I don't know what is. So <laughs> thank you for doing that. Um, and who knows what risk he's taking being there without a mask. We'll, we'll know later on. <laughs> He's got his mask right beside him there. Very good. <laughs> Great. Thank you, Pedro. Wonderful to not only hear your presentation, uh, but also uh, to have you there in the place that you're talking about. Uh, that's very, very special. And thank you very much, Marcus, for uh, a very impressive uh, view of the work you're doing around data. It's certainly a model for, for so many of us. Now, uh, we were just in um, Brazil. We're going to now head back over to Europe. Uh, we're, we're heading all over the world, and we're going to uh, hear from um, Ar Ar Arjen Hoth. Uh, so he's going to be doing um, a case study uh, of smart parking in Utrecht, uh, combining data from EV charging stations and parking sensors with Fireware's technology for improved services. And just a little background on Arjen. 
uh, studied environmental urban planning uh, and he wrote his thesis on sustainable new neighborhoods. Um, and it's never been more important than today, that topic. Um, it's a very big, very much a constant uh, in his life. Um, uh, he, he's been working in e-government uh, first as the head of an innovation program focused on digital services in Amsterdam and later in the shape of a cooperation between Dutch municipalities to implement standardized software for municipal service delivery. Great. And standardization is certainly a theme we're hearing today. So I'll hand you over to Arjen. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Jonathan, and thank you for having me here and for a great introduction. It's always great to hear what you already have achieved in life. Uh, uh, and it's all, almost, I feel old a little bit, uh, but okay. Um, I will tell you a uh, use case what we are doing in the city of Utrecht. Um, what you see over here is Central Station in Utrecht and the white building on the left is the Town Hall in Utrecht. And Utrecht is the fourth city in the Netherlands, the fourth largest city in the Netherlands, uh, almost 400,000 inhabitants and the fastest growing city in the Netherlands. The central theme in Utrecht is healthy urban living. It's the fourth largest city in the Netherlands and it's also the fastest growing city. So they have major challenges and they focus a lot of on cyclists and on uh, energy transition and things like that. And I will uh, highlight one demonstration project that we are in. Uh, underlying is our city innovation platform in the city of Utrecht, um, where we uh, have accomplished many more projects, not only on the topic that I'm going to show right now, but also on air quality and also on parking spaces and other things. But that's good to know and it's all based on the fire air solution yes uh, and now what i will show uh, is not only a technical solution because that is what i changed in my presentation a little bit because i've heard a lot of stories and i've heard the quote about einstein in the beginning and i have a favorite other quote from uh, buckminster, Fitt, uh, uh, buckminster Fuller, who says a fool with a tool is still a fool um, and that's a lot of the discussion we are having as well you can have a great platform but uh, in Holland, we focus a lot on citizen participation and transparency and citizen science projects. So the underlying technology is an enabler to achieve things, but it's also about other topics involved. So the challenge in Utrecht that I will focus on, and that's uh, something related to this challenge of energy transition and healthy urban living, is that the city of Utrecht is focusing on a in implementation of over 5,000 new EV charging stations in the next five years. So they will incentivize uh, electric transport in the city and that's the reason why you can see many more of these EV charging stations. Um, an interesting thing in these charging stations is whether those stations are really available for an electric uh, vehicle when you drive into the town and use your route planner to find a free spot, is it really free? So what we did in Utrecht, if I can see the next slide, uh, is did some investigation and what you see over here is that someone parked his or her car, probably a his, his car on a spot that you can see on the back where there's an EV charging station, but there is no plug inside because this is a fossil fuel car. Um, so this fossil fuel car is parked on a parking spot that was meant or is meant for a EV vehicle. So if you use your route planner, drive into Utrecht, which uh, is not very helpful for car drivers, then you want to be sure that you are driving to a free spot. So how can we increase that in Utrecht? Uh, so what we have done is that we started a project on the platform to see and to improve the availability and the usage of EV parking spots. Because it's not only in the previous picture that you saw that it is um, uh, for, the ex for the exploitation of the EV charging stations, they, they have a lot of money because it's not used efficiently, the charging stations. And for the driver, it's annoying because you can't find a really free spot. Next one. So what we did is we installed also um, parking sensors in the parking spots. 
So if the parking sensor detects a car and says, I feel there's a car above me, and the charging station says there's no plug inside, then that's an illegal situation. And this one, it sounds really simple, but behind this picture, there's a lot of things going on. We have heard the discussion about governance. The charging stations are run uh, by a independent company based on the procurement of the city of Utrecht. The data from these charging stations is dealt with by another company. They outsourced the data management part. The parking sensors in the ground are from a Belgian company. So in this simple example, we have almost six or seven stakeholders involved, um, managing the sensors, managing the data, giving access to the data. So if you want to create a solution, not only for law enforcement, but also for uh, improving citizen services, you have to talk and deal with all those different stakeholders to get the data, to combine the data and make it accessible for third parties to create innovative new applications to use it. So what we did is combining these data, as you can see over here on the left one, that's the correct situation on the right one, that's the wrong situation, but also think about, okay, what does the data mean if we get it out of these sensors and combine it. Can I see the next one? So this is the charging station and the, and the parking spot. Next one is first we created the demonstration using a simulator to see if it really works. Because um, if a car parks, then there is no plug inside within a few minutes. So there might be an illegal situation according to the data but according to the driver who has to get his cable and plug it in, you need to have some time in between this situation. And if there is someone from law enforcement running across the street and seeing you and giving you a fine, that's not a really uh, a situation that you want to have as well. So we demonstrated these different scenarios uh, in first in a demonstrator and then for real and toggle these different situations to see what is happening. We have implemented now 50 of those sensors in the city of Utrecht and combined the data streams within the fiber technology. And I won't go into it too deep, but you can see there's a lot of relationships between the different standards, the transformation of the data, because in this case, um, the sensor data has a different format than the EV charging station sensors. And we combine it through the context broker of fiber to make it available, not only the actual status, but also the historical information, because the historical information is also valuable for the city to see how those charging stations are used and if they even need more charging stations within the city. This is an example from the first thing. It's just, you see the streets are, uh, and the, the stations on the left, and it's just for the colors. But we were quite surprised that in certain places, almost 60% of the time, there was illegal parking. Um, and you can imagine what kind of loss of money that means for the owner of the EV charging stations, but also for people trying to park over there. We, wouldn't, we did not imagine that in the beginning, but it's really a good business case for the city of Utrecht now to improve, the, improve their service delivery, but also see in which neighborhoods the problems actually uh, uh, are. So what are we going to do now? Because the whole goal of this one is to open up this data uh, for everyone to reuse based on Fiber and GSI API. So we now make this data stream from these two, do two sources, the parking spots and the EV charging stations available. And this is what we've seen uh, in the presentations from Bristol and from others as well. We are now working on what we call the marketplace, and we have seen it in other things as well. That's not only a technical solution, but we are combining these different data sources into uh, a marketplace where you can subscribe to these different data sets. And we have another project running about air quality. It's called Snifferbike, but also something called Measure Your City. It's a citizen science project. Some of these data streams are for free, are open data. But we are also experimenting with different plans and subscriptions on this data. So you can have the raw data as open data, 
but if you want the refined data or the formatted data and you subscribe to an API and you want to have a high availability and an SLA service level agreement uh, to it, then you have to pay for it. So that means that we also are experimenting now with monetization models and new business models for people exposing this data to be reused. So this case about these EV charging stations with Utrecht implementing a lot of new of these uh, uh, EV charging stations is also a stepping stone for other projects that we are doing in energy transition, sustainable water management, mobility projects, etc. to learn not only from a technical perspective, but also from a more procedural and organizational perspective, how different organizations work together, what kind of new business models are applicable and how can we create the right stakeholder management? Because a lot of times we talk about a city or a municipal identity, a municipal organization, but this whole EV charging station example shows that the city is only one small actor within this whole project and we need to have a governance structure in place to create sustainable and lasting solutions. Next one. And that was the last one. Very nice. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, such a, a good, rich uh, description of a solution to a massive set of problems. Uh, we will be facing uh parking and, and and transportation related issues for a, a long time to come I, I'm, I'm reminded how in many of our newer cities over the 20th century um how much uh, are dedicated to to roads in, in some instances it's 60 percent of the city is built to support transportation and um, it would be fabulous for us to remember that we build cities for people and we should get back to building cities around people and not necessarily around cars um, so thank you very much and well done on, on some amazing work there can't wait to see what you do in the future and now we we go from utrecht in netherlands to uh, austria to the city of vienna um, often in the top three if not the number one uh, best places to live in the world um, and and so excited to hear this presentation it's a use case um, called uh, City of Vienna Open by Default. And uh, here's a little test for me on pronunciation. We have Franz uh, Pfaffenbichler. Uh, hopefully I did okay. Uh, <laughs> it, it is spelled in a way that's more confusing than it sounds. Uh, yes. and he is the service manager for e-government and trust services um, with uh, Vienna Digital at the City of Vienna. Um, he's been at the ICT department for the, at the City of Vienna since 2014, uh, starting in the domain of trust and identity. Um, he's now working in the field of e-government and smart city uh, for a few years. And he works on national and international cooperation between public authorities and is currently focusing on this uh, urban data platform, which is smartdata.vien, W-I-E-N, the actual real spelling. Um, so looking forward to this. Uh, uh, Vienna is certainly one of my favorite places. I try to get there regularly. So Franz, the floor is yours. Thanks. I don't know if you hear me. Now we can hear you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yes, we can hear. Okay. In my screen, it's muted, but when you can hear me, everything is fine. I share my screen. Here we have the slides. You see them as well. Um, we can start. Thanks a lot for yes, having we me. Your, we, we can hear you and we can see the presentation. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I have the pleasure to tell you a little bit about supporting open innovation and enabling the data economy in Vienna today. So let's see. Um, I have um, just 10 minutes, so we I will only go briefly through the three aspects, open data strategy, open innovation, and our open data platforms. The city of Vienna was the first administration in the German speaking area to publish an open government data portal in May 2011, based on a government agreement and its commitment to open government data. 
since this date that uh, like for example geo web services are published as part of the city of vienna um uh, of the city of vienna uh, and its open government data initiative enabling the worldwide use even for commercial purposes 2015 between the vienna social democrats and the green party signed an agreement to force the open government initiative in vienna this political backing is very important and a success factor for well-developed open government initiative. Therefore, the administration can refer to the government if there are any troubles through the implementation. For each new project in the city of Vienna, where the data is not be published, it must be justified by the project team why it cannot be classified as open data. Open data brings transparency and participation is the fuel for innovation and the basis for new businesses, fields, and a wide range of applications, such as apps, websites, analysis, or other services. The administration itself also benefits from open data, for example, because it can easily use data from other agency or as a basis for digitization projects. The data is just part of the department's knowledge management. In our digital agenda, Vienna, we placed a very strong focus on citizen participation. The purpose was to collect ideas, perfect them in an open space, and then implement them as apps. The interaction with citizens has taken place alternately online in the platform and offline in working groups. Open source software is uh, the innovation driver behind many of the current technology trends with which digital transformation is taking place. Cooperation across organizational boundaries is only possible with open standards and algorithms, which are propagated significantly by the spread of OSS. The strategic use of OSS is therefore also important for the city of Vienna in order to create transparency, increase security, and promote young talents through cooperation with open source communities. Let us take a quick look here at some of the results of our last digital agenda. These are also examples of open cooperation. Um, about 12 developers have participated in order to bring the best together. Open innovation without open data is not possible here. There were over 28,000 data sets from one 1,200 organizations in our Austrian open data portal. If you are a developer using OGT datasets, you can also register your application on this site. Over 500 applications using OGT have already done so. The unique aspect in Austria is that we place all our OGT under one license, unlike other countries. Our focus is that the data can be used commercially for free because our policy is make government data available to its citizens. BI means that the only condition is to name the source of the data. This also guarantees the reliability of the data sources to the users. The open data of the city of Vienna, as well as the data of the federal government, other provinces, cities and municipalities can be found at the national data portal Data give our team. The European Data Portal, European Data Portal EU, collects the metadata of many European data portals, including our Austrian Inspire give our T site. As you may know, on the European Data Portal, the metadata are translated into more than 20 languages and that is available for use by international data consumers. One of our projects in the framework of framework of Smart City Wien is the project Smarter Together. It is a EU funded project together with Munich and Lyon with the objective of car sharing, refurbishment of flats and citizen participation. To display the different data sets, we decided on a data platform based on Fireware. As City of Vienna, we are gold members of the Fireware Foundation. Together with the expert of the foundation, a sketch of structure of the platform was created. Fiverr retrieves the data from the Open Data Portal Data Authority and via IoT sensors. There is also a security layer that ensures that only everyone sees the data 
for which he is authorized in specific city dashboards. Furthermore, there is a basic visualization in Fiverr to view the data without scoring the raw data. Smart Data Wien also serves beyond Smart Together for other smart city projects of the city of Vienna. For instance, we have real-time data on public transport, bike sharing, and environment-related data, all graphically displayed in our own Austrian base map. Based on the Fiverr module principle, we have uh, we created a simple architectonic diagram with Lego bricks. Uh, Marcus Marconi also gave a short presentation today, so I would like to take the chance to mention him at VM9. VM9 was significantly involved in our first Fiverr implementation for Smarter Together and created our wonderful user interface. We are currently transferring our Fiverr data platform to our own data center in order to build up more know-how in-house and to be able to use the platform for other projects. Here two Fiverr partners have given us essential assistance for that. Thank you very much for your attention. And as far as you know, there are no, now the possibility for quick questions, if there are any questions. Mm -hmm. Thank, thank you so much, Franz. Uh, excellent presentation, and congrats on the uh, incredible work you've been doing. Uh, I, we do have a question for you. Uh, yeah. Very often, Vienna is designated as one of the world's leading smart cities. Uh, what do you think that you guys got right and we can learn from you? I know he's probably talking, but I'm not hearing. Did we lose you, Franz? I think we might have lost your audio. Um, well, unfortunately, we've, we, it looks like we lost. Uh, no, uh, yeah, now I'm uh, back. Okay. Sorry, I well, lost you for a second. I got disconnected. Didn't quite get you the, the question. Oh, sorry. So the question was, often uh, Vienna is designated as one of the world's leading smart cities. And we were just wondering, uh, just maybe one or two points, why you, what you believe you did right and we could learn from you. <laughs> um, we have a very strong focus to being open. But as our title as well, Open by Default, we want to offer our data sets to the not only to the citizen, but also to the um, to corporation and businesses. And uh, that is what we are doing as well for the next year. We want to focus more on citizen participation. So we, are, um, we will be uh, or we will publish our new citizen participation platform in the near future. I hope so. Very good. Well, thank you and congratulations. Uh, my final question, um, I'm going to direct this, uh, if, if Marcus Marconi is still with us, I imagine he is. You there? Yes, I'm here. Yes. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, so you talked about your, you know, your your um, open data and, the, and, and uh, both you and Pedro mentioned sort of the open innovation ecosystem in Rio. Um, could you maybe just share uh, one or two examples of, of, of outcomes? Um, and the challenges of uh, that, that program working with startups in Rio. Yeah, that's it. Uh, the, the, the core, oh, Pedro, you can, you can help me in this, in this answer uh, mm -hmm. about the Open Innovation Program of CORE. Uh, yes, in fact, uh, Pedro is the, the planning coordinator of the, the CORE and the, the, the coordinator of the Open Innovation Program that the startups uh, take place. So, uh, I, I'd like Pedro explain and I compliment uh, his, his answer. Okay. Okay, fine. Uh, so uh, uh, we developed two open challenges. Uh, the, 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 the challenge that we propose. So in the first one, we propose a challenge for startups to come develop with us uh, solutions that enhance our performance to response, to make quick responses in heavy rain events, right? And then the second open challenge, uh, it more it was a challenge more dedicated for uh, urban mobility. So uh, 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 the challenge was to help us and build new solutions to to uh, uh, help us and enhance our capacity to manage the, the the impacts of heavy rains in the bus system. 
But uh, just to, to, to talk about a little bit more about outcomes, we have like uh, since the beginning 2010 from now, we have like uh, 70, 80 partners, 70 or 80 institutional partners of, on this uh, core innovation program. Half of them are, are from private sector. It's really a challenge for us to engage private sector to be with us. And uh, I can mention, for example, another, uh, uh, you know, number, a big number here. Uh, for example, our second demo day in August, in past August, we have like uh, 2,000 uh, views on YouTube in a live broadcast. So we're trying to, to you know, to, to, to gather uh, 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 innovation actors around the world, you know, in order to build the uh, uh, innovation ecosystem to help us to, you know, uh, build this model that we are trying to build uh, towards uh, how to put the uh, Uber Common Control Centers as smart city platforms. So, it's more or less. Okay. Like this. Yes, and, and Jonathan, uh, the, the most important here uh, was to bring fire technologies to this context. Uh, Rio has many data sources. Uh, in fact, these data sources uh, sometimes not work together. And we use it using fire technologies. We, we could concentrate all of them uh, under open standards, uh, uh, organizing these data models from harmonized data models and boosting the capacity of handling events and, and watching the situation of the city in order to, to identify trend patterns and trigger early warnings to the operation room. So uh, in order to perform in a more predictive way uh, and, and allowing core and helping core to be more efficient in the city and the operation of the city. So uh, fire technologies help us and help, has been helping us uh, during all the time we are in this ecosystem, uh, improving and boosting our capacity to develop solutions faster and, and easily. Okay. Great answer. Thank you both so much for that. And like all good things, this one uh, needs to come to an end. Uh, but before I hand you over so, uh, to Fireware for some final comments, um, I just wanted to say a big thanks to each of the speakers. I want to thank uh, Cornelia Levy uh, uh, Benchaton for her. Uh, talk about building trust in our broken systems, particularly that have been revealed as a consequence of COVID uh, in our cities. Big thanks to uh, Peter Fetelnig, um, who talked about you know the uh, emergence of cities and their responses during the pandemic, and he reminded us to be uh, optimistic and great economic opportunities still still lie ahead. Uh, thank you to Jason Wittet. Um, who is the uh, Digital Innovation Lead at the Arizona State University Smart Cities Cloud Innovation Center. Um, and he spoke to us about data exchanges as a catalyst for open innovation. Um, a great uh, presentation from Paul Wilson at the city of Bristol on creating an open programmable city and stressing the importance of a digital infrastructure uh, and having fun. Um, a great thank you to Wanho Hero uh, from um, the Fireware Foundation, the CTO, gave us a, a very brief overview of uh, this remarkable platform that's expanding rapidly around the world. Thanks to again, Pedro and Marcus uh, from Rio and for sharing the operation center there in real time. That was a real ton of fun. Um, <laughs> thanks to uh, Arjen Hoff. Um, who is at the, uh, he talked about smart parking in Utrecht and gave us a, a practical example uh, showing not only what they're doing, but the results, which we all uh, try to drive towards. Thanks to the city of Vienna and Franz Pfaffenbichler, uh, who is the service manager for e-government and trust services at uh, Digital Vienna. And um, I think that's it. Uh, hopefully I didn't miss anybody. Um, I think I got everybody. Thank you all very much for incredible participation and great to see so many people hang out for this entire duration. Um, amazing content. It is available by video on YouTube. Um, so you can go back and review any areas that you want to see again or perhaps missed. And with that, I'm going to hand you over to Christina Brandstetter, who is the Chief Marketing Officer for the Fireware Foundation. She's going to give us some closing comments. Uh, over to you, uh, Christina. 
Uh, thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, and I, I see you did already some great summary too. So <laughs> I will uh, try to just give a few more more comments on that. I think it was really an amazing um, widespread um, content that we've heard today. Not only content, it was uh, anything from uh, what we felt and and saw in 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 this year 2020 so much hit by COVID and obviously our cities hit hit very much by COVID um, up to real cases that um, um, talk even about um, climate and and good air um, up to how to integrate and have a good project running so it's a really wide span of, of great things. Um, I, I want to pick up one um, one message or one comment that Cornelia did because she said um, COVID broke a lot of things this year and um, why I'm picking this up is because I had just a call this morning with the city of Kiel that's a, a very quite a famous city for sailing it's in the northern part of Germany uh, next to the seaside and um, the, the call was with the CDO and actually he stated um, looking at projects that were just hanging around for some years, thanks to COVID, we were able to get um, decisions and make things happen in many cases within two weeks. And um, beside the very bad things that we had to face this this year, um, I, I heard some, some good things there too. And um, saw people that really want to work with data and projects around data for the common good. Um, obviously they did before but they want to do much more as they saw the good in that and that, that made me very positive so I thought it was an absolutely stunning um, experience uh, that people really faced um, the, the challenges took it on and we also talked a lot about citizen collaboration. I think it also paid into that and um, proved that without citizen uh, collaboration, it doesn't work. With the collaboration, it works much better. And so I'm also grateful for um, the examples we heard at the very end of the session that all of them stressed this point more or less, but it was an important fact for success in all of them. So thanks also from my side for um, all the great speakers and what we've heard today. And we have a few more things uh, that are upcoming and I want to use the very last two minutes to show you on the next slides um, what we are doing from fiber side and fiber community side in smart cities. So I'm very, very proud to say that we've just launched yesterday um, a great initiative that's called smartcities.events. We're actually showing there really um, a, a big wealth of, of events, of webinars, of also some of the still existing live and face-to-face -face events um, around smart cities. Uh, we're filling that up continuously and you can go on it, not only to check what's going on maybe in your region or in your time zone, but also to fill in your own events. So use that. I think it's really beneficial as we want to move on and help everybody to work with open data and open standards. So that's a great new initiative and we want to grow that worldwide. On our next slide, uh, we will just see um, that uh, we're also creating a smart city catalog. Um, this is not new to Fiber. we've been doing that um, for a while, but we want to update that one. So I'm um, just asking everybody of you, if you run or have seen a Fiber project, if you're a city running a project, just fill it in. For many of you, we know it, but we really want to grow it. Furthermore, as Fiber is growing, also our catalog should grow. So help us doing that and just go on this link. Uh, we will share it also through all our newsletters and further communication also on social media. And um, last but not least, there is other events upcoming. And as we learned, Smart Cities is really a, such a wide field. Um, we could have talked, and I think Jonathan, he's smiling already. Um, he knows that you can talk weeks and weeks for that. And um, I think you're even doing lectures and you know learning campaigns. And um, of course, we will do a second edition too. Uh, we have already a date for that, and as we have fantastic speakers, they couldn't wait to get into the next edition. So that's November 5, and we'll welcome everybody to, uh, to be with us. And of course, at uh, that, we also say a big thank you to our sponsors, helpers that promote these great events with us. So going back to the stage before, I just want to mention 
uh, mention them once more as you see them, which is Business Reporter, Compass List, uh, Smart Cities and Zoom. And um, by the way, we also just had a publication on Forbes we're quite proud of. So if you just go and check for um, Forbes and Fiverr, you find great content there as well. And yeah, said that, some other um, great smart smart um, Fiverr days are, are, are coming next to the Smart City one. So we have one for agri-food, industry and mobility. And of course, uh, just in a week from now, there is the famous a smart country convention usually in Berlin. Now it's fully digital, but uh, we're not less present there. So you will hear Ulrich speaking and myself um, and uh, many, many more people with great topics, partially in German, but also many um, events there in English. So just visit it. I think there's great content around cities there for you too. So thank you very much to everybody and a very, very special thanks to Jonathan. It was absolutely a pleasure to work with you and to have you all the, all the afternoon for us and the morning for you with us. And yeah, keep in touch. Uh, you have lots of um, uh, contact possibilities and options here. Uh, we're just showing that. And um, if it was too quick for you, obviously the whole session is on demand from tomorrow on. Thank you very much also to all our speakers. Have a great rest of the day, afternoon and evening, and see you soon again for the next Smart City Day, uh, November 5. Goodbye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thanks a lot. Take care. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye, thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.